Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner for the second time this week. Luckily, there's been a bunch of interesting stories since our last episode on Monday, so still plenty to talk about. Also, we've just launched this hoodie design in our store. You can see there's a bit of a benchmark bar type theme going on here. I'm also wearing the stealthy black option, but it is available in several other colors. So yeah, if you're interested, go check that out at store.hardrunbox.com. Uh, it's really soft, so it's perfect for the upcoming Northern Hemisphere winters. Here in Australia, it is gonna get into summer shortly, but it's still pretty cold. So I think I can get away with a hoodie for now. Anyway, let's talk about AMD once again to start off this news corner. They just have a knack at the moment of releasing little things here and there to keep themselves in the news cycle. This time around, launching two new Ryzen 3000 CPUs, which we did see rumored a couple of weeks ago. The first is the Ryzen 9 3900. A fairly straightforward CPU here. It's a 65 watt version of the Ryzen 9 3900X. So a 12 core 24 thread Zen 2 design with the TDP lowered from 105 watts down to something more manageable for small form factors and OEM systems. This sees the base clock drop from 3.8 gigahertz down to 3.1 gigahertz. And the boost clock also sees a reduction from 4.6 to 4.3 gigahertz, hopefully with no issues reaching that 4.3 gigahertz figure at launch. The other new CPU is the Ryzen 5 3500X, which slots in below the Ryzen 5 3600, offering a six core design without SMT. So six cores and six threads compared to six cores and 12 threads with the 3600. Clock speeds are similar with the same 3.6 gigahertz base clock and 65 watt TDP as the 3600, but we're also seeing a slightly lower 4.1 gigahertz boost frequency. The bad news here, well, neither of these CPUs are actually available to purchase as an enthusiast builder, unless you happen to be a system integrator. Yep, these are OEM specific CPUs with the 3500X. It sounds like it's actually a Chinese market specific OEM product, so a bit of a double whammy there. The 3500X to me sounds like a pretty compelling product, so it's disappointing AMD has decided to restrict that to OEMs. There's certainly room in the market for a $150 or so Zen 2 CPU that sits below the 3600, and the 3500X could have been just that. We did see some additional rumors for a 3500 non X model, so I do hold out a bit of hope that AMD will release that to the general market. But for now, these chips are for pre-built systems. And to be fair, this isn't the first time AMD has restricted these mid-range processors to OEMs. We saw that with the Ryzen 2000 series when AMD launched the 2500X and 2300X. However, those chips were basic quad cores and released at a time when the 2600 was already selling for well below its MSRP. And I think we also had capable quad core APUs available to buy. Whereas right now, there are no Zen 2 CPUs with fewer than six cores and no Zen 2 APUs. So whether AMD launches a 3500 to market or just waits for APUs, well, we'll just have to see. MSI has accidentally confirmed a new chipset called TRX40, which we talked about in News Corner a little while ago. A promotional page on the MSI website listed an eligible motherboard as the Creator TRX40, a product that, well, hasn't launched yet. It sits alongside the Creator X299, indicating this is probably a motherboard for HEDT platforms. MSI has, of course, since removed this motherboard from the page, so yeah, a bit of a slip up there. The current rumor going around is that AMD will launch several new chipsets for upcoming third gen Threadripper parts in the form of TRX40, TRX80, and WRX80. So far, we've only seen products leak that use the TRX40 chipset, so who knows whether those other chipsets are actually real or not, uh, but it certainly does sound like TRX40 will be replacing X399 for HEDT platforms moving forward. Another rumor has been floating around recently suggesting that TRX40 will not be compatible with older first gen and second gen Threadripper CPUs, with the chipset only being used for third gen. At the same time, time, third gen Threadripper won't be backwards compatible with X399. Given third gen Threadripper is set to be a significant change of older generations, this isn't a huge surprise, uh, but it still is a bit unclear why this change would be required since a lot of Epic CPUs are compatible with older motherboards. In any case, AMD are set to unveil Threadripper 3000 in November alongside the launch of the Ryzen 9 3950X. So we should be getting TRX40 details there and a new suite of motherboards, and we'll find out whether that backwards compatibility situation is actually truthful. Intel are discontinuing basically their entire KB Lake lineup, including KB Lake G and some remaining older Skylake processors. Given these 7th gen chips are now several generations behind current 9th and soon to be 10th gen offerings, this is just a standard process for Intel as they move towards only offering newer products to customers. 
Let's start with KB Lake S. Almost every CPU here is listed for an end of life date of April 24, 2020, meaning that customers interested in these chips must make an order before that date if they want one of these CPUs. These shipments will then happen by October 9, 2020, and this includes CPUs from the Pentium G3950 right up to the Core i7-7700K. There are some exceptions. Four processors available to purchase as part of a tray will receive Internet of Things status, so they will be available a little longer. These chips are the Core i7-7700 and 7700T, as well as the Core i5-7500 and 7500T. Presumably, these were more popular than others with IoT device makers, and three very low-end Celeron chips will also remain on the market. For Skylake S, most chips are already end of life, but two that remained, the Core i7-6700 and Core i5-6500, will also be sunset on the same days as KB Lake S. This news also affects Intel's KB Lake G lineup. That was the interesting mixture of a quad-core Intel KB Lake CPU and AMD Radeon RX Vega GPU on a single package, along with HBM2. These chips didn't get much traction in the market. There are only a few laptops to use them along with a NUC from Intel, possibly because OEMs had already moved on to faster six core configurations with a more powerful discrete GPU. KB Lake G sales will end on January 31, 2020 with final shipments by July 31, 2020. So a little earlier than the rest of the KB Lake lineup. The reason for sunsetting these products? Well, Intel probably want to maximize 14 nanometer capacity for newer products, especially as a significant chunk of their 10th generation will still use 14 nanometer manufacturing. We know supplies are constrained here, so it makes sense to ditch products that probably weren't generating a whole lot of sales anyway. In other Intel news, the company has officially cut the pricing of some 9th generation F and KF series processors. Many of these CPUs were already being sold below their MSRP through places like Amazon and Newegg. This just makes those price cuts official and also makes them a bit more competitive up against Ryzen. The CPUs in question, which range from the Core i3-9100F to the Core i9-9900KF, have typically seen price cuts in the $25 to $35 range. This now makes them definitively cheaper than the non-F models, which include a functioning iGPU. It never really made much sense for Intel to release a version of these CPUs without an iGPU for the same price as the iGPU-enabled models. Wouldn't you just get the iGPU version even if you don't need it? But, you know, now they have corrected that. Uh, the Core i9-9900KF with its new bulk price of $463 is a particularly good option given its gaming performance performance, while the Core i5-9400F at $157 could also be a tempting deal for mid-range system builders given the lack of Zen 2 processors below $200, which I was just talking about earlier in this video. Back to AMD news now, Hexus has uncovered a document from Gigabyte that details overclocking the Ryzen 9 3950X on their Aorus X570 motherboards. Most of the document isn't all that interesting given most people here know how to overclock a CPU, but there is an interesting tidbit towards the end. Gigabyte claimed that in their testing, they've typically been able to achieve a 4.3 GHz all-core overclock using 1.4 volts V-Core on the 3950X. So this would match the overclocks we've seen from chips like the 3900X, which can typically hit 4.3 GHz as well. So 4.3 GHz across 16 cores would certainly be impressive. Gigabyte also said that they managed to get one of their 3950X CPUs running at 4.4 GHz. So that would represent a typical golden bin type situation if you're lucky with your silicon lottery and what you end up getting. A lot of you probably won't find this too surprising, but it is still interesting to get semi-official information from a board partner ahead of the launch next month. As usual, we've got some quick topics to finish this week's episode off. Intel has spoken briefly about their XE graphics at IDC in Tokyo, mostly about their efforts to bring XE GPUs to low power platforms like integrated graphics and other mobile products. One of the key goals with XE is to hit 1080p 60fps in popular esports titles with integrated graphics, which is something current iOS Plus products, even on 10th generation CPUs, uh, cannot do. It also seems that XE will launch with ray tracing support in their discrete GPU options which kind of makes sense since at this point it's expected that AMD will join Nvidia in having hardware accelerated ray tracing next year. If Intel XE didn't launch with this functionality, they'd quickly be left behind. We're still expecting a 2020 announcement and potential launch for new Intel GPUs, but all important performance of discrete GPUs still remains a bit of a mystery, though I guess it's probably not all that surprising considering the launch is still a little bit away. And finally, 
TSMC has hit mass production status on its second generation 7 nanometer node, otherwise called 7 nanometer plus or N7 plus. This refined node uses extreme ultraviolet lithography, which wasn't deployed for first gen 7 nanometer, bringing a 15 to 20 percent improvement in density, along with a 10 percent improvement in power consumption relative to 7 nanometer. AMD is expected to use 7 nanometer plus for their next generation products, while several ARM SoC manufacturers will also use the tech. Meanwhile, TSMC's N6 node, or 6 nanometers, is about to hit risk production status in the first quarter of 2020, with mass production expected later next year. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe to get this segment in your inbox every Friday or Mondays when we decide to run two a week. Consider supporting the channel on Patreon for cool perks like access to our Discord channel, or you can buy some merch as another great way to support what we do. And we have got these new hoodies available, which I think look pretty good. That's it for now. Back to some benchmarking. I'll catch you in the next one.